Well, for those of you who remain, I want to invite you to open your copy of God's Word. We're going to be looking at two passages today, two brief passages, because as I was thinking about the Reformation itself and, and an introduction to the Reformation or the significance of the Reformation, these two passages really stuck out in my mind. So they're up on the screen, but I encourage you to have uh, your Bible handy as well. The first one we're going to look at is Jude, verses 1 through 4. Or you may think Jude chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, but Jude only has one chapter. So Jude 1 to 4. And then we'll be looking at Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 8. So Jude, who was a brother of our Lord, writes this. Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. So that's what you are. Called, beloved, and kept. Okay? May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Okay? So we as believers are beloved, called, and kept for Jesus Christ. Okay? Have you ever realized that you are a love gift from God the Father to God the Son? You are preserved for him so that in the final analysis after history is, uh, has been folded up like a scroll, you will be basically a trophy of God's grace. You are beloved. And so may mercy, peace, and love abound to you. Right? Now, to that end, or for that reason, then Jude is writing this letter. Because he wants mercy, peace, and love to be multiplied to you. But there is a threat to that. And it exists in the form of a false gospel. So let's look at verses 3 and 4. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. So the only way we are going to experience mercy, peace, and love in our lives is through the faith that was delivered once for all. No subsequent revelations, no subsequent visions. It was given once for all. And it comes through this faith, which is why we must preserve it, we must protect it, we must defend it, we must strive for it. It is precious. And the only way, then, that you can have the life God wants you to have is through this precious resource that we must defend. So then, roll back to Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 to 8, as we see just how serious our Lord is about this. Galatians 1, 6 to 8. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. Think about that. Even if an angel should show up here on this platform in all of its resplendent glory and strength and start telling you that there's another way to heaven... Let him go to hell. That's what he's saying. And what's interesting is that a departure from the one true gospel in verse 6 is equated with deserting God himself. Okay? It is precious. Now, is Paul just being persnickety? Is Jude just being overly cantankerous? 
They are both desperate for the glory of God manifested in the lives of people. Their concerns are eminently pastoral. They want you and me and the world at large to experience the grace of God. But if you have a different gospel, which is no gospel at all, then you have undercut the entire thing and you have literally sold people a false bill of goods. And then they will believe, live, and die in vain. And in the meantime, subject themselves and their lives to all sorts of ruin. So these passages underscore the ex- exclusivity and essentiality of the gospel. Let's pray. Almighty God, we thank you. We thank you that you have saved a people for yourself, that you sent your son to fulfill the law and to suffer its curse on our behalf. We thank you, Spirit, for applying all the benefits that Christ merited and for giving his grace to us, for giving yourself to us as a seal of our future inheritance. We ask, God, that you would be with us. Help us to be faithful, to contend even in our own era for the faith delivered once for all to the saints. In Christ's name I ask this. Amen. All right. Well, it's probably no surprise to you that I love the Reformation. Out of all the human eras, out of all the various topics of study, I love the Reformation the most. Studying the Second World War is fantastic. Studying the founding fathers and the revolutionary era of our own nation is wonderful, but nothing comes close in my affections to the Reformation. I'm kind of a history geek, so when we were stationed in Germany, you know, I tried to go visit the places where these things happened. And it was pretty impressive to go to Wittenberg and stand there. We had to, we had to you know, they were getting prepared for, the, for this year, the 500th year of the Reformation, so just about everything associated with Luther was under massive renovations. And so we had to, you know, wait until the workers uh, went on their lunch break so we could sneak close enough to the doors and, and you know, snap a picture and stuff. And, but it was awesome seeing all this stuff. The courageousness of the era, the dangers of the era, the, the principles of the era, it's all just intriguing to me. But is historically interesting enough? Something can be interesting without being significant or without having any bearing on our lives. I would suggest to you, though, that what started there in Wittenberg on October 31st, 1517, and how the sparks that shot out from that backwater town in eastern Germany and made their way to Zurich and Strasbourg and Geneva and then over to the Islands, and then around the world, that it has changed the world to this day. Even basic ideas in our society, such as public education, public hospitals, free market capitalism, a democratically elected representative form of government, all these things found their genesis in the Reformation. Okay, that's cool. But here we are gathered in a Presbyterian church. We are direct descendants of the Reformation. But unfortunately, most descendants have a hard time relating to their ancestors. We oftentimes have a hard time relating to our own pasts. Doubt it? Look at a picture of yourself from a decade or two ago. And you'll probably have a slight degree of embarrassment about the way your hair looked or about the way you were dressed. Sometimes our relationship to the past is one of embarrassment. You know, we think that our grandparents, while lovable, were were hopelessly out of date, out of touch. 
Sometimes our notion of our regard for the past is downright hostile. And we seek to purge memories of them. We act like their flaws were so great that there's nothing good we can learn from them. And so sometimes we try to totally separate ourselves from the past. And let's be honest. Sometimes that's our attitude about the Reformation. I mean, our culture teaches us that above all else, we should be compromising and and easy to get along with and that you shouldn't be too sure of yourself because that's arrogant. And you go back then, and that was an era where people lived and died by their principles. How do we relate to that? You know, Martin Luther takes a lot of heat for the fact that he was not willing to join forces with Zwingli over the Lord's Supper. Martin Luther said Christ's body is present in the elements. Jesus said, this is my body. And Zwingli said, no, this is a memorial. So Martin Luther gets a lot of heat. Well, Zwingli wasn't willing to compromise either. Both of them. The whole era was defined by sticking to one's principles. So how do we relate to something like that? It it was an era where the logic of the day was such that, you know, murderers kill bodies, and so we execute them. Well, heretics kill souls, so we should execute them. That was the logic of the day. How do we relate to that? That seems foreign. That seems crazy to us. Well, I don't want to pretend that the culture of the 16th century is identical to the culture of the 21st century, okay? We have advanced or progressed, some of you might think we've regressed, 500 years. So there are differences. There are. So we should not romanticize the past. And I don't want you to think that I would ever suggest we should go back to the way life was in the 1500s. Frankly, it was horrible. I've been to Luther's house and the the town sewage creek basically ran through his property. Disgusting. They couldn't even drink water because it was so contaminated. I mean, it was just the plague followed people from town to town. Luther had to, a few times during his life, had to get out of Dodge Because the bubonic plague came in and killed off everybody. I'm so glad we don't have that issue anymore, aren't you? I'm so glad I have running water that's safe to drink. That's wonderful. I'm glad I don't have open sewage in my backyard. That's nice. Okay? So things have changed, and in many respects for the better, but I would also say many things have changed because of the Reformation. But even as things have changed, some things have stayed the same. Back then, the Catholic Church was the dominant cultural voice. Okay, it's not the dominant cultural voice now. But the principle that there was this large, controlling, influencing uh, factor in society that shaped and directed the narrative of the day that you had to be in agreement with or else extreme effort and energy would be taken to shut you down, that you had to conform with the worldview or else you were on the outskirts. Well, that principle still applies. In fact, I would suggest that that principle in our own society applies perhaps now more than at any point since the Reformation, where we have a large meta-narrative that has been imposed on our society, the the ideology of, of secular progressivism, that demands conformity and compliance, or else they will shut you down. They will try very hard to get you fired or whatever. And so... Presenting the gospel in a culture of hostility is what the Reformation was all about. Well, that has some profound lessons for us. At my house, we've been watching America's Got Talent. 
and we all had our favorites. And, uh, you know, it just finished up this past week. And if you watched uh, the, the judge's comments to each performer, when it was a particularly good performer, the judges would say something like, you know, you were great, you were whatever, whatever, you were relevant. You were relevant. You were relevant. To be deemed relevant is to be deemed a player at the table. Conversely, that's right, James Bond. Yeah. I remember that uh, a few months ago, Kay wanted to watch a romantic comedy, so James Bond it was. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. To be deemed relevant is to have a seat at the table. You, you matter. To be deemed irrelevant is perhaps the greatest criticism you can ever be given. If you are judged or labeled irrelevant, you are basically brushed off to the ash heap, and you are not a factor. Now, when Simon or one of the other judges would tell the contestants that they were relevant, what they were saying was that their performance in some way, shape, or form conformed to the concerns, interests, or tastes of our modern pop culture. So in that vein then, at 500 years of age, is the Reformation still relevant? And I would say a resounding yes. Okay? The, the context has changed somewhat, but some elements of the context have stayed the same. But I really believe that in the very core of the Reformation, we have some principles and some uh, assertions that are now more relevant than ever before. For example, the Reformation was about a recovery of the word. And it was about relying on the power of the word to effect change. Luther famously stated, late years into the Reformation, just a, just a few years before he died, he talked about how he personally did nothing. I did, he says, I didn't advocate armed resistance. I just preached and taught the word. And once I unleashed the word while I ate, slept, or drank Wittenberg beer, the word did everything. And it so weakened the princes and the papists that no other force on earth has ever uh, wreaked such havoc upon it. The Reformation was all about getting the Bible into the language and then into the hands of the people. And once we unleash the Bible, once we derive our energy and our strength and just let God's word do its thing, amazing stuff happens. Now, I believe that is needed just as much now as back then. Because for us, we oftentimes minimize the value of the Bible. The Bible, we're so familiar with it that it just sits on the shelf assumed rather than consulted. We think that success in building our church, success in running our lives, success in building the kingdom relies upon our ingenuity. Really, it relies upon unleashing the Spirit. And the Spirit works through the Word. And so the reformers were all about preaching the Bible, teaching the Bible, and even singing the Bible. Singing the Bible. In most churches nowadays, we, we don't sing the Bible. We sing vaguely spiritual concepts based upon passages in the Bible, but the idea of singing the Bible sounds like crazy talk. But that's exactly what the reformers did. In every way, shape, or form, they brought everything back to the Bible. The Bible, Bible, Bible. And I believe that that is a key to ongoing Reformation in our own day. We could talk about how the Reformation really gave birth to the notion of how we train, support, and send missionaries. When Martin Luther found that his academy in Wittenberg, people were coming from all over Europe, and they left his 
home, and they went back to the Netherlands, to other places in Germany, to, to Switzerland, to France. They took his books with them, and many of them met their demise. But a vision for the good news being presented to the nations so that the peoples could be glad was birthed in the Reformation. And the Reformation taught us that when someone lets goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, that it's not a tragedy. To give everything in the service of Christ is not a tragedy. It's glorious. The Reformation taught us that. That one man or woman armed with the Word of God and a deep abiding sense of the power of the Spirit can literally change a nation. That's what John Knox did. They prayed real prayers. Give me Scotland or else I die. That's what he said to God. Changed a nation. We could talk about how the Reformation was made possible by the strategic use of the technology available of the day. Did you know that Martin Luther was not the first voice of reform in the church's history? There were others. But in every preceding incident, the church was able to put the kibosh on it. They were able to contain it, to limit the damage. They were very effective at managing crisis situations until Luther. You want to know why? This thing called the printing press. Initially, when Luther posted his 95 theses, He intended to have a debate. He wasn't trying at that point to start a reformation. He wanted to have a debate to clear up some ecclesiastical abuses. But some of his students, without his knowledge or consent, took the 95 theses down, translated them into German, and then started publishing them. Wow. I mean, you get sued nowadays. And because the Roman church had not caught up to the use of, to the speed of life in a technological age, did you know that from the time Luther posted his theses, it took them six months to even get around to addressing him? Guess how many copies of his theses had gone around Europe in that six-month time? Nearly half a million. Okay, so by the time they even responded, half of, I mean, incredible. Now, since that time, The church has made wide use of the available technology. Radio technology was a huge one. In the 40s and 50s, as missions movements were being started in Central and South America and Asia, they were able to broadcast AM and FM signal into the void, apparently, but reach previously unreached peoples living in the jungles or getting it past iron curtains. And then, of course, came television, And then the internet. And what the Reformation calls us to see is that the technology of our day, far from being a a corruption, is actually a rather helpful and powerful medium by which we can get out our message. So let's not be Luddites. Let's be Lutherans in that regard. And vigorously support that. But mostly, mostly the Reformation remains remains relevant because at its core, it represents the answer to the question, how can I have peace with God? How can I have peace with God? That sensation that there is something wrong nags at mankind. It literally nips at our heels. We live with the acute awareness that something is not right. People spend their lives trying to figure out what they need. What's that missing piece? Or they spend their lives trying to distract themselves or to deny that there's a problem. But the issue persists. It nags at us, nipping at our heels. There's something wrong. There's something wrong. There's got to be something more. And Augustine, of course, famously framed it 
in the late 300s when he confessed to God, you have made us, O Lord, for yourself. And our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Okay? We were made for someone. And our hearts then are restless until we find that rest in the one for whom we were made. So the issue of guilt that we know we have offended a God is in every person. Romans 1 makes it clear that everybody has a basic innate knowledge of the existence of God and of the fact that we are not in right relationship with God. Furthermore, that our rebellion against God deserves judgment. We have this deep down knowledge. And so we try to concoct religious schemes, philosophical outlets that try to get us quelled in our sensation of guilt and shame. By the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church had developed a highly sophisticated system by which people could feel that they had done their part to be as presentable as possible to God. But ultimately, there was and is no assurance. That was one of the chief criticisms at Joan of Arc's trial, was that she was claiming to have assurance of her salvation. And she was condemned as a heretic in large part based on that. But even in the most current Catholic catechism, they vigorously deny that the, that the people of God in this life can have assurance of salvation. You will go to purgatory. You will pay for your sins. You will suffer for your sins. So how do we have assurance? It's just not there. It's not. That's why to this day, I mean, I have worked with scores of Catholics and ex-Catholics, and the church specializes in guilt. The notion of Catholic guilt is almost a running joke in our society. Guilt, 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 guilt. Well, where's the relief? How can I have peace with God? Now, I don't want to bust up on Catholics because they're not public enemy number one. They're not. Times have changed. But a full 50% of the people in the world who self-identify as a Christian still identify with the Catholic Church. So the Catholic Church makes up 16% of the world's population. So we need to be able to interact with them. But in our modern world, we've turned psychiatrists into our priests. We've tried to envision a naturalistic world where everything can be equated in the natural world only. We've tried to push God to the margins. And so our priests become the ones who dispense the grace we need, and the grace we need in the modern world is medication. And so in 2016, one in six Americans are on a prescription psychiatric drug, which is up from one in 10 Americans in 2008, which itself is 21% more than it was back in 2000. Even as we're told to celebrate who you are, be true to yourself, love you. The elective cosmetic surgery industry is a booming $16 billion a year business as people are literally uncomfortable in their own skin. I could go on and on about the precipitous rise of destructive behaviors such as cutting or self-induced vomiting or self-starvation. I could talk about the chronic dissatisfaction that people have with their lives. But the world has been like that forever. The problem is we are lost in the dark. And we have a vague notion that something is wrong. And our hearts are restless. We desperately need to grasp onto something that will give us the meaning that we otherwise lack. Mankind, now as ever, has a problem. Now here's the thing. 
for all of our anxieties, insecurities, phobias, and shortcomings, for all of our offenses against our fellow man, you know what our chief problem is? Our chief problem, this may surprise you to hear, is God. Why do I say that? Because God stands there in the middle of the road. And you will confront God. And we will come before him in our sin, in our lostness, in our rebellion. And we will give an account. And so the problem that plagues mankind perpetually is I cannot stand before a righteous and holy God. God is the one who will judge us and we hate that. Our problem is we will stand before a righteous God. Now, the Reformation did not teach you that, okay? Even the Catholics understood you would stand before God. Unfortunately, they had turned God's one mediator, his son Jesus Christ himself, into a vengeful judge for which we needed mediation just to get to the mediator. No, what the Reformation recovered was the beauty of the gospel. Namely, that God isn't just our problem. He's our only hope. Did you know that? God is not only our judge, he's our savior. That's what the gospel that was recovered told us. You see, as Martin Luther and John Calvin and countless others discovered in the pages of Scripture, the beautiful thing about the gospel is that in the gospel we learn that the wisdom of God devised a plan whereby the love of God could save us from the wrath of God without compromising the righteousness of God. From start to finish, God is our Savior. And so the Reformation above all else was zealous about the gospel because the gospel gives people hope It gives people freedom. It gives people the ability to glory in God rather than tremble in judgment. It was not a theoretical movement. You know, we're going to learn about how in the Reformation they had discussions about whether grace is imputed or infused. What does that mean? Their concern was not theoretical. It was eminently practical. You want proof? Think about this. Luther came to a knowledge of the, of the gospel approximately 1516. But it wasn't until October 31st of 1517 when he posted his theses. Why? Because that's when this monk, named, this traveling salesman named Tetzel came to town hawking indulgences, telling people that if they broke their piggy bank and depleted their savings account, they could, you know, get off. They could have a free ride. In other words, it was salvation for sale. And he knew that was selling people a false bill of goods. They were putting hope in something that could possibly do them no good at all. They were stealing the only hope these people had of being right with God and having any joy in God. And that's what incensed him. So if you care about the joy of the nations, If you care about the good of God's people, if you care about the glory of God, then you care about the gospel because it's true, it's clear, it's precious, and we must maintain it and defend it for to do its saving work. A compromised gospel is no gospel at all. Now, as they unpacked this Reformation doctrine, it touched on the whole of life. And so in the next five weeks, we're going to look at these five key areas about the role of Scripture, the role of grace in our lives, the role of faith, how we get grace credited to us, the nature of our salvation in regards to Jesus himself, and then how our lives are to be lived in the light of all that God has done, namely for the glory of God. These five key concepts, I believe, will help us to hold tight to the faith that was delivered once for all to the saints. And I want to invite you to cling to your Bible for life because it is life.
in Christ. Let's pray. Word of God speaks.